Good morning, Ebenezer family, and to all of you that are joining us this morning. We are grateful to be able to worship together, even though we are apart. And I know that you will be encouraged this morning through the message. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your consistent character, that you never change, that you are our rock and our refuge. You're our strength. You're our supporter. You're the giver of life. You're the one who walks with us through every season. You never turn your back towards us. We love you, God. We want you to be honored and glorified today as we worship you. In Jesus' name, amen.
at your name The mountain shake and crumble At your name The oceans roar and tumble At your name Angels will bow The earth will rejoice People cry out, Lord of all the earth, we shout your name, shout your name, filling up the skies with endless praise, endless praise, Yahweh, Yahweh, we love to shout your name, O oh Lord. morning breaks in glory at your name creation sings her story at your name angels will bow the earth will rejoice people cry out Lord of all the To Ebenezer family and friends, if you're joining us on our live broadcast today, and hello to others who may be joining us at a different time of the day or on a different day of the week through our uh, Facebook page, our YouTube channel, or even off of our website. Uh, welcome to another Sunday morning Webinizer broadcast. Uh, if you don't know me, my name is Cal, and I'm part of the staff team here, and uh, happy to be guiding us in our service this morning. Uh, we are in the midst of what we're calling our Equip You series of messages. Uh, really what we want to do is address some of the questions that I know you, uh, your family, uh, your friends may be asking during this COVID-19 pandemic, this, this crisis that, that is all around us. During this time, we know that there are many questions about God, uh, about life, other practical issues that have come to the forefront because of what's going on. These are very natural, important, and even necessary questions that, that come into all of our minds. And our desire in this Equip You format of messages is first to shine the light of God's Word into these questions and to equip you to be able to respond lovingly with really the truth of God and His Word into the life of, the, of those who may be asking uh, these questions. Now, for the last two weeks, our focus has been on God questions. We began by looking first at the question of, like, where is God in all of this? Uh, why would God allow this and allow other kinds of suffering? Last week, we addressed the question of 
who is God? And, and even what might God be saying to us uh, in this time? What might God be trying to say to the church during these times? Now, if you haven't had a chance yet to see those messages, I encourage you to take time to do so. And again, you can do so on any of the platforms I mentioned just a moment ago. One of our special guests last week, Dave Buring, made this very powerful and important statement and observation. He said that our natural human inclination, when it comes to the question of who is God and the challenging circumstances of life we all find ourselves in, is our, our tendency is to look at God through the lens of our circumstances. But if God is truly going to be God, we cannot shape our understanding and view of God through the things that happen around us. Because those things are always changing. They're always forcing us to ask questions. We must, as Dave said last week, learn to look at our circumstances through the lens of who God is. And when we grow in that, our perspectives, our view of our circumstances, the highs and the lows, the joys and the tragedies, they begin to change and they begin to align more fully with the nature and the ways of God. Now, if we're going to learn to do that and to grow in that, we have to learn to see God accurately for who he is, not for what we think he is, or even worse, who we want him to be. Otherwise, it's kind of like this part of the video uh, where we're trying to see life through a dirty or a distorted lens. We need to grow in our knowledge and understanding of God so we can learn to grow in our experience of God in, in all of life's circumstances. Otherwise, we might miss what he is doing right now in us, all around us. God actually longs to reveal himself to us, his creation. There are several ways he does that. This morning, we're going to look at one of those ways, and it's how God reveals himself, who he is, his nature, his character, and his ways, in the names of God as found in the word of God. Now, some of those names are names that God gives to us, but some of those names are also the names that we, our humankind, have given to God based on their experiences with God. And because we trust that God is never changing, he's immutable, those truths of those days are the same for us today. So, so, so what's in a name? When we think about the names we give to our children, or in some instances, the names that we give ourselves, often we base them on preference or popularity. But, but, but there are times today when names are given because of what they mean. If you tune in with us on our Easter Sunday service, you'll remember a, a young couple who named their young daughter Anastasia which means resurrection. During their pregnancy, their child experienced significant health issues, and there was a lot of uncertainty surrounding that whole situation. But this young couple trusted that God would bring something beautiful out of their circumstance, and so they named their daughter Anastasia. And by the way, Anastasia is doing fantastic, and, uh, and it's just a real joy uh, from the pictures that I've seen. God reveals who he is through the names found in scripture. And this morning, some of our Ebenezer staff are going to share with you a name of God that has had particular significance and meaning in their own personal lives and how it has helped shape for them a more accurate lens of who God is. So sit back and enjoy as our staff share with us what's in a name.
The name of God that has anchored my life, that I've experienced and has helped me through my life, is I Am. And I hope that this can be a name that you can believe in and experience yourself. It comes from Exodus 3.14, where, where God is revealing it to Moses. God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, thus you will say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Now, it, it almost seems ironic in the story that Moses is asking for a more specific name of God beyond just the God of our ancestors, and God re replies back to him with what seems at first a more abstract or mysterious name, I am, or literally, I will be. This strange name of God comes to Moses in a strange way as well, in the surprise of an unexpected experience, in a commonplace, a bush in the desert, while Moses is at his lowest and potentially farthest from God in his life's journey. Many believe that the name I am that God was revealing is revealing that God is real, active, creative, and eternal. His presence can be found anywhere, often in unexpected times and places, and often when we are at our lowest. This is a God who we reverence when we experience in these moments, and we can take off our sandals and be in awe of this direct and gracious presence that God gives. The real experienced presence and freedom that was revealed in I Am contrasts with the gods of Egypt, who are controlled and used by the corrupt leaders for their own benefit in that society. Yahweh is unlike uh, those gods of state religion and power, and I Am is a god who creates a people freely, not be not a god or gods who are created by people and used as they please. I am shows us a god who is experiential, eternal, and free. And I am meets us in the darkest moments of our stories for redemption. In my own life, I've experienced I am as a creative, gracious god who met me where I was at in a dark and unexpected moment. In my early teen years, uh, those years were marked by my own rebellion. I wanted to take risks, have experiences of pleasure and freedom from what I saw was uh, religious moral control. And my personal turning point was a burning bush moment, uh, meeting God in an unexpected way. I Am spoke to me through a Bob Dylan song titled Shelter from the Storm. After facing some of the consequences of my own foolishness, uh, my own attitudes and feeling ashamed, angry, and tired, one of the lowest points I can remember in my life, I listened to this song and felt as though God himself was saying that he could give me shelter from these storms. So in response, I prayed a prayer, a simple prayer of desperation, and I, I experienced God. I felt God's presence, and I felt a weight lift off of me. And this, moving forward, that would be kind of the point that I reference as my turning point. Uh, and now when I look back on my life and often through those painful memories of, of those years, I can now see God in unexpected places and in unexpected ways, in, in narrow misses or unexpected friendships or in my own conscience speaking to me. And God's presence was all over my life and I had not seen it until I responded to Jesus. As the Israelites' ancestor Jacob had put it, surely the Lord is in this place, and I was not aware of it. There's this mysterious aspect of how God meets us. Jesus himself brings the full and final revelation of this idea of God being I am. Multiple times in the book of John, I am is directly associated, and Jesus claims that, and people attribute that to Jesus. There's a quote that says, we cannot direct the wind, but we can adjust the sails. John Ortberg uses this often quoted saying as a metaphor for our spiritual lives. I am is not to be controlled. We, we can't uh, know always or control or have these experiences at our demand. But what we can control is kind of adjusting our sails through spiritual practices and, and by having faith and being open to this God so that we can cooperate with his spirit and experience the, this God. So that's my encouragement for us. Let us adjust our sails through spiritual practice. Let's reflect back over our own lives and never lose our awe and our expectation of this free creative act of God who is waiting to be responded to, the great I am. 
In scripture, we find that God will occasionally refer to himself with a name that actually reveals a bit of his nature and his character. In Exodus 15, the nation of Israel has been wandering the desert on their way to the promised land, and they've been traveling for three days and haven't found water till they come along to the pool of Marah, and the, but the water's bitter. They just can't, they can't drink it. And so God directs Moses to a piece of wood, which he throws into the water, and it purifies it, and the people are then able to drink their fill. After that story, then God names himself with a name that actually reveals something of his character. And I'll read from verse 26 of Exodus 15. He said, if you listen carefully to the Lord your God and do what is right in his eyes, I will not bring on you any of the, of the diseases I brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. In Hebrew, God actually names himself Jehovah Rapha. It's one of those names that reveals something about who God is. And we see it in our Bibles in the English as the Lord is my healer. I've had conversations with a number of people who have actually experienced God's healing power. Accounts of God's accomplishing physical healing are not uncommon among our missionaries, especially those who are overseas. And I've also personally witnessed spiritual healing as people choose uh, God over the enemy of our souls. Personally, uh, I've experienced God's hand in my life in terms of emotional healing. And I shared a little bit from the pulpit with our Ebenezer family that, that I went through a, a period of burnout a little while ago, a couple years back actually. Today, I'm just gonna share a little bit more of that story. It's not unusual for people to say that they feel a bit burned out. We've heard that, we've all heard that. But my burnout was not only a deep level of fatigue, it was actually diagnosed by a clinical psychologist as early stages of depression and anxiety from the situation that I found myself in. At times I couldn't remember the alarm code to my house. Couldn't remember my social insurance number. We had moved about a year prior and I had to be really careful driving home and mindful of each turn that I took or I'd get lost. Fortunately, it was re recommended that I take a medical leave for ministry. And during that time, I was able to get the physical rest that I needed as well as the emotional recharge. And slowly over time, I began to read scripture again and God met me in that time. And I mentioned to some of our Ebenezer family as well that God often brought me to the story of Joseph and of how God led Joseph through some very difficult times in order to bring him to a place where he was extremely fruitful later on. The Lord also gave me the opportunity to help someone else while I was on leave. The mother of a neighbor down the road had been recently widowed and she needed a bit of work done in her home. So I was able to help a couple of hours here and there doing some minor finishing and touch-ups. Working with my hands has always been therapy for me and so I think helping her out was as much help for me as for her. After 10 months, I was given a clean bill of health and God opened up the opportunity for, work, for me to work in construction for a while until God called me back into ministry. Now my personal experience of God, he, God's healing, it's not instantaneous or miraculous in, in like some of the instances that I've heard of, but I did find healing through the situations and opportunities that God brought to me. God knew exactly what I needed before I did. And as he brought me to what I needed, he brought his healing along with it. So when if, I, if I'm asked today, does God heal? I can say that he does. Sometimes he chooses to heal in miraculous ways Sometimes he chooses to heal by way of circumstances and situations that he guides us through, like he did for me. And sometimes God's healing takes a lot longer. And sometimes it doesn't come until we see him face to face. But regardless of the timing, I know from my own experience that God is Jehovah Rapha. God is our God who heals. Jehovah Jireh. We first see God revealed as the provider in Genesis 22. Many years before this story uh, in Genesis 22, God had made a promise to Abraham that he would make of him the father of a great nation. And after some missteps along the way in which Abraham failed to trust God to keep his promise, he finally receives a son whom he names Isaac. Genesis 22 takes us to the story of how God tests Abraham by asking him to take his son Isaac to the top of a mountain and sacrifice him upon an altar for um, whom he had waited for many years. Abraham was 100 years old when Isaac was born. He had waited a long time to see the fulfillment of God's promise to him. And now God was asking him to sacrifice his only son. 
It's an astonishing story as we read how Abraham is obedient and places Isaac on the altar of wood and is ready to plunge a knife into his son, and God interrupts him. He interrupts him with these words, Do not lay a hand on the boy or do anything to him, for now I know that you fear God, for you have, have not withheld your only son from me. And Abraham looks up and sees a ram in the thicket, and he realizes that God has provided an alternative sacrifice for him. And Abraham names the place the Lord will provide. In Hebrew text, God is given the name Jehovah Jireh, the Lord, my provider. This name also foreshadows God's provision of his son, Jesus, for our redemption and salvation. Well, my discovery of God as my provider began following my husband's death almost 10 years ago and continues to this day. God called me to a new, a new life. I was told its name was widowhood. I didn't like it. It felt more like uncertainty, fear, loneliness, poverty, loss, at times even despair. Although I had surrendered my will to God's will for Daryl um, shortly before his passing, now I struggled to accept the reality of everything that came with this new life. And with that struggle came the doubt that I could trust God to provide for me. I can't say that I just obeyed God immediately like Abraham did. My story resembles a little more Jonah's story of uh, running away. I wrestled with God for at least a year, and I remember the day I confessed out loud to God that I didn't think he could provide for me as well as marriage and life with Daryl had. Hearing myself say that today, I'm somewhat embarrassed um, and humbled that this was my response to God. Despite having been a Christian for most of my life, this revealed where my faith fell short. Clearly, my trust had been in Daryl, in our own abilities, and in the life that we had built together, rather than in the one who created me and had watched over me for 50 years. But you know, instead of judgment and shame, God whispered a gentle reassurance to my heart. And I heard these words, that's okay. All you need to do is look for me and I will provide. And that was the beginning of me waking up to the provision of God in my life. I know now that it didn't just begin that day. It had been there every day of my life. I just hadn't recognized it as I began to recognize it now. I began to see God write his name Jehovah Jireh all over my life. He began to heal the loneliness and pain first, reaching into the farthest reaches of my soul and bringing me peace where there shouldn't be any. How he gathered up all the broken pieces of my heart and put it back together is still a mystery to me, but he did it. I am no longer broken. I am stronger and more at peace than I ever have been. God brought people into my life that have given me companionship, encouragement, support, friendship. I have a nuclear family that all love the, uh, God and try to follow his ways. I have so much more appreciation for those gifts in my life. Do I ever miss marriage and the relationship that, um, that I had with Daryl? Of course I do. But God has provided relationship for me in so many different ways, people and places, even including the Ebenezer family. And I am seldom lonely. He is my provider. One of the immediate needs I was confronted with when Daryl died was financial and particularly my need for a home. Without going into all the details, I can say that God provided me with a beautiful home in very unexpected ways. And every time I turned around, there was another provision of finances for me. It actually became unbelievable, and sometimes I would just have to chuckle to myself. 
Even when I would try to give back to God or give back somehow, God would outgive me, often double what I had just given. My eyes began to see what I had failed to see before. God was providing for me, sometimes even before I had time to pray. There were times when I would receive an unexpected check uh, and I would wonder what that was all about. And in the next few days, God would reveal to me either something, there was a need that I uh, was going to need to um, uh, meet or there I'd find out about somebody uh, who needed some help. And God provided a way always for me to bless when you have the means to answer someone else's prayer, it's really amazing. I think this was another way in which God has provided for me, allowing me the joy of giving. And uh, lately, as our building project began to uh, come to life, and, you know, I just ask that God would allow me to be able to be part of this wonderful project and be able to share in the joy of seeing God's kingdom advance in this way. And as I prayed and asked God to let me be part of this, he has been providing. I also needed to change my career path at age 50. And I was full of fear about that. I dreaded having to put myself out there again. I was, uh, I was just, I had so much dread. But God gave me not just one job, but two jobs during this time that I never had to go out to find. Both jobs came to me through a phone call, including this present position here at Ebenezer. It's another story all in its own, how I came to Ebenezer, but I see God's hand all over it. As I continue to see God open doors and make provision for me, I know that this journey is not done. I need only to trust in my God, and he continues to be my Jehovah Jireh. Jehovah Roi, the Lord, my shepherd. God is referred to as shepherd numerous times throughout scripture, but this morning I'm going to focus on David's reference to God as his shepherd in Psalm 23. David, whom God called a man after my own heart, understood what being a shepherd entailed. As a young man, before becoming king, he was a shepherd. He spent years caring for his sheep. He knew that a good shepherd takes care of all his sheep's needs, protecting them from harm, leading them to good grazing and away from danger, finding still water for them to drink from, and bringing them back to the flock if they wandered away. He understood that sheep knew the sound of their shepherd's voice and that they would come to him. The longer the shepherd works with the sheep, the better they know him. In writing Psalm 23, he took his knowledge of being a shepherd and connected it to what he knew of God. Let's take a look at just the first five words. The Lord is my shepherd. These five words, although simple, are incredibly rich in meaning. The Lord declares God's role. He is Lord in David's life and can be in ours. Is means the relationship is current. It wasn't just in the past or going to be. It is happening right now. My. This signifies a very personal and intimate relationship. It is a statement of belonging God is my personal shepherd as I journey through life. He's also your shepherd, but our journeys are not going to be the same because we are different people with different experiences and different places along our journey. From the use of the word my, we know that we can be connected to God individually. He isn't just the shepherd for his people, but for me. Not only that, but if he is my shepherd, then I belong to him. I am his sheep. And finally, shepherd. This is a declaration of God's role. He will lead and look out for our best interests. We only need to follow. 
As I look at my life, there are multiple instances where I can see God taking care of me and leading me as my shepherd. When I was younger, I struggled with my identity and worth, trying to be the person that I thought people wanted or expected me to be. I often felt like I wasn't good enough to achieve that, so I pretended. I wore a mask and tried to do everything right, but it was exhausting and I was overwhelmed with always trying to figure out what people thought of me. I remember the Saturday night of a college and career retreat before I was on staff here. We were having a time of worship and communion. I was so tired of worrying about what other people thought, and as I was praying, I cried out to God. Then I heard it. God spoke words to me that have forever changed my life. It doesn't matter what other people think. All that matters is what I think of you. When I accepted that as truth, he changed me. I went from being afraid to call and ask for information on the phone to being able to speak in front of large groups of people. I actually felt as if I had been tied down by chains and that they were suddenly gone. All that mattered was that I was being obedient to what God had called me to be. At that moment, I knew God was speaking to me. I understood it was his voice and that he needed to, me to hear from him audibly right at that time. Although there are still times when I wander back into comparing myself to others and wondering how they see me, I, I know he will always bring me back. I haven't heard God audibly like that again, but as I've grown in my relationship with him, I have come to recognize his voice as I read scripture, as I pray, and when he speaks to me through others. I am able to differentiate between the lies that Satan tells me and that would want, he would want. I am able to differentiate between what lies Satan would want me to believe about myself and how God sees me. He is my shepherd, and I know his voice. More recently, I have seen God as my shepherd in the way he has cared for me and provided what I need when I needed it. Some of you know that anxiety is a part of my life. Usually I am able to manage it well through a variety of tools, including prayer, getting enough rest, medication, etc. When we first started social distancing, I began to have anxiety attacks getting groceries. I had a number of people who offered to get groceries for me, and I thank you guys for that. But I had a sense that I was still supposed to go on my own. I put it off for a few days, but I eventually chose a day and decided to go for it. In hindsight, I'm so glad that I decided to. I truly believe it was God telling me to go so he could remind me that he would take care of me. That Wednesday, I was getting increasingly anxious the closer it came to the end of the day that, because I knew I would be going. I even had a friend offer to stay on the phone with me while I went in case that would help as I was going. She prayed for me and reminded me I needed to be listening for and to God. Shortly after that, I began to feel quite calm. Then I got a text from another friend who had started to pray for me at the exact same time. Another picked up a mask when I, that someone else had made for me. Already, God had provided exactly what I needed to get through it. But he wasn't even done yet. As I pulled up to the store, I was getting a bit shaky again. But as I got out of the car, the first person I saw was another really good friend. He had just been inside and was able to tell me how things were set up and give me an extra boost of confidence. I hadn't, e I hadn't even realized how much I needed the reassurance of seeing someone right there. But God knew. He provided exactly what I needed as I needed it. As I walked inside, all anxiety was gone. I am going to continue trusting God and following him as my shepherd. I am going to continue getting to know him and continue to know his voice even more as I read his word, pray, worship, and honor him. 
I will remember how he has guided me before. I don't know what the future brings, but I know that God is Jehovah Roi. He is our shepherd. He is our Lord, with whom we can have a tender, intimate relationship. He cares for us deeply and takes care of our needs. He will protect us and guide us. We can be sure we are precious to him when we look at the way he cares for us on earth, as well as by providing us with our home in heaven. I'd like to look at two names of God that are closely associated and relate to God's presence. In the Old Testament, Yahweh Shammah, the Lord is present, the Lord my companion. In Genesis, for a short while, we see a close relationship between God and Adam and Eve, and then sin destroyed that relationship. Fortunately, God didn't abandon humanity. He chose a people for his own. He delivers them from slavery by his presence and his great strength. God dwells with them in the form of a pillar of cloud and fire, then in a movable tabernacle in the wilderness, and later in the Jerusalem temple. Then God's people sinned, and God's presence was no longer there. In Ezekiel 37, we read of the Valley of Dry Bones and the prophecy of God gathering his people from among the nations and bringing them home, establishing a city putting his temple among them forever. And when my temple is among them forever, the nations will know that I am the Lord who makes Israel holy. The last verse of Ezekiel 48 declares, and from that day, the name of the city will be, the Lord is there. In the New Testament, Emmanuel, God with us. Jesus is the greatest of all the promises of God in him, God's promise to dwell with his people is fulfilled in the personal presence of God, the Son, as he revealed the Father during his ministry on earth. And then a step further and closer for us to be indwelt by him through the power of the Holy Spirit. God is truly with us. How do these names of God relate to my walk with him? I accepted Christ as my savior when I was eight. I grew up in church, serving, involved in music, youth, Sunday school, prayer meetings, Bible studies. Our family was there pretty much every time the doors opened. The church was my comfort zone. I was one person at school and band, but I came alive at church. By the time I was 16, I had my own key to the church. If there was an evening that nothing was on at the church, I was there doing my homework and taking trumpet breaks. I hid from the world, yet felt called to ministry. I'm amazed at how the Holy Spirit worked in my life over time to transform my life to be more and more like Jesus. When I started work after high school, expectations in the workplace were much higher. Participation and engagement with, with co-workers was not optional, but the reward each month was tangible. I engaged with the workplace around me, and the compartments of my life slowly began to merge. I began to take baby steps towards living Christ outside of the comfort zones of church and home. I was in my mid-twenties when our pastor moved beyond preaching to convey knowledge and hone doctrine to how relevant the scripture is to our everyday lives. With the guidance of the Holy Spirit, the truth of the scripture hit home. Emmanuel, God with us, is what it means to live Christ every day. God desires to be a part of every moment of our lives, not just the times at the facility, every moment, everywhere. Doing life with Christ is an adventure. In the last five years, I've had a number of severe health issues. In the midst of those, Emmanuel, God was with us. 
today, Emmanuel, God is with us. Jehovah said, can you? The God of righteousness. I grew up in a Christian-based home and church, and I was taught what right and wrong living was. I was quickly given feedback on any wrong or unrighteous living that was going on in my life. So, without knowing it, I formed a very early work for your righteous standing with God kind of mentality. My measurement for righteousness and right standing with God was based on my own actions. As a result, some days I felt like I was very close with God, and other days I felt like God was very disappointed with me and therefore far away. When I was 20 years old, I went to Bible school for a year. In the very first class that I attended, I learned about God's grace, his mercy, and his love. And most importantly, how Jesus's righteousness was the only thing that could redeem me from my sin. My righteousness wasn't dependent on my actions, but what Jesus accomplished on my behalf. I wept several times a day for the next several days as that truth sank into my heart and permeated my mind. This key understanding began changing how I lived my life every day. I wanted to live for God out of thankfulness for his sacrifice that brought me righteousness, not because I had to try and earn my righteousness or my right standing with God. The first time that God refers to himself as Jehovah said, can you, is in the book of Jeremiah. During the time frame of Jeremiah's life, the older generation of Israelites had walked away from following God and worshipped other gods. Believe it or not, they said that there was so much evil in this time frame that God told Jeremiah not to take a wife, not to have kids, because of all the evil in the land and therefore the judgment that was going to come upon them. It was bad. In the midst of that season, here's what God said through Jeremiah to the leaders of the Israelite people, scolding them after scolding them for not leading the people in God's ways. Jeremiah 23, verses 3 and then 5 and 6. I myself will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the countries where I have driven them, and I will bring them back to their pasture where they will be fruitful and increase in number. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, a king who will reign wisely and do what is just and right in the land. In his his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will live in safety. This is the name by which he will be called, the Lord, our righteous Savior, Jehovah Sidkenu. The word Sidkenu means righteousness. It's translated hundreds of times as right or righteous or righteousness, just, justified, declared innocent. This name speaks of the fact that God will always do what is right, because he is righteousness. In other words, in the midst of Judah and the Israelites doing their evil and turning away from God and his ways to all kinds of despicable things, God steps in and says, I am righteousness. I am the standard of rightness. All of you might have different standards of right rightness, but I'm telling you that I am the standard, the absolute standard. You need my righteousness. Scripture says this about us. Man has no righteousness in himself. Romans 3.10, as it is written, there is none righteous. No, not one. 
In fact, Scripture says that we can't attain righteousness, the, the righteousness of God, by ourselves. Romans 10, 3. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. God knows we are unrighteous and that we need a pardon from him. And this is why in Jeremiah 23, verses 5 and 6, the promise of the Lord for the people of Israel was that he was going to send a Messiah, Jesus, the one who would provide a permanent sin solution for mankind. Jesus was made righteousness to us. 1 Corinthians 1.30 It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus, who has become for us wisdom from God. That is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. 2 Corinthians 5.21 God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. If we believe that Jesus is God's son, and he did this, what he did for us, to sacrifice on our behalf, then we are justified in God's eyes. We are made righteous. Jesus can stand before the Father as a righteous judge, drop the gavel, and say to the Father, I've got check covered. Don't judge him according to his sin because I paid for it and I want you to see him as blameless. The father accepts Jesus' righteousness as as if it were ours. This is the state of our righteous standing before God. Thank God for his righteousness. Knowing this should change how we worship and thank God for his righteousness. Knowing this should change how we combat the enemy of our souls that tries to get us to work for our own righteous standing with God, which actually is never attainable. Instead, we can call out to God for his righteousness and rest in the righteousness of Jesus. Then we can live our lives pursuing righteous living with right motivation out of thankfulness, not out of duty. What a gift from God Jesus' righteousness is to us. Well, after hearing that teaching and hearing those testimonies, I can't help but think what a truly awesome and amazing God that we serve and we worship. And that's just a taste of who God is. I pray that you will continue your journey of discovering God, not just at the end of this message, but if you continue through life and as you have opportunity. And as I trust that as you do so, you will grow in your love and your obedience to this incredible, mighty, and great God. How appropriate it is that today we can respond by sharing together in the Lord's Supper. If you need to take a moment to gather the elements, now go ahead as I continue to share. You you don't need anything fancy. It's a little bit of bread and a little bit of juice of any kind is fine. And as you get that ready, let me just share with you one final name for today. Now, this isn't a direct name of God, strictly speaking, but it's an important name with an important meaning. The name of Jesus. In Matthew chapter 1, an angel appears to Joseph and tells him that his fiancée Mary was going to have a child and instructs him to name the child Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. Then later, Paul in Philippians chapter 2, in an almost prophetic type of passage, says this. He says, Therefore God exalted him, exalted Jesus, to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You see, communion is a celebration of who Jesus is. It's a remembrance of what he has done for us in his death and his resurrection from the cross. 
And because of his ascension back into heaven, it is an anticipation of his most certain return. So this morning, as we've reflected on the names of God and this revelation of who God is, let's take the elements with great thankfulness to this amazing God we worship. I'll invite you now to take the bread. And scripture says that on the night Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread, he gave thanks, and he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Take the bread and let's eat together. Now I'll take you to invite you to take the cup. Scripture continues and says that after Jesus, uh, sorry, after supper, Jesus took the cup and he said, this is a cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's take the cup together. Let's join together in a closing prayer. Father, we thank you so much for who you are, how you work in our lives. Father, thank you that you indeed are a God who longs to, be, who longs to reveal himself to your people, longs to be known. And I thank you that through the names that you have revealed to us and through the names that people have given you, we get a glimpse of who you are. Father, may we know you so that we can truly experience you in all areas of our life. And as we've taken the bread and the cup this morning, we thank you for the work that your son Jesus Christ did for us on the cross. And we wait with great anticipation to your return. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, thank you for joining us again today. Have a blessed Sunday, and we look forward to being together again next week.
working Even when I don't feel you working You never stop, you never stop working You never stop, you never stop Even when I don't see you working Even when I don't 